it's just uh, one slide after the other. So some of my slides have animation. animation. Ah, yeah, then it's then would be good. Yeah. Live stream has started. It's just uh, one slide after the other. So some of my slides have animation. animation. Ah, yeah, then it's then would be good. Yeah. Stream has started. It's just uh, one slide after the other. So some of my slides. We were in a loop. Huh? Dr. Kaslik, we may begin. Okay, thank you, Aido. So, hello, everyone, and many greetings from the Traces Asia Laboratory. And welcome to the opening of our third archaeology webinar series at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Thank you all for your interest in our webinar and for joining us today for the opening lecture of an exciting term card 
that presents us with amazing research and narratives on the deep human history. This archaeology webinar started as a one-time event and, and as some sort of a response to the restrictions caused by this pandemic. But we had actually a lot of fun doing this, as well as a very interested audience. And so it has now become a regular activity that will hopefully continue for many years to come and bring us together with the leading scientists in this discipline. As always, this webinar is jointly hosted and facilitated by Edo Balboa, Mylene Leasing, Dr. Rixar Fuentes, and myself. The webinar series is supported by the School of Social Sciences, its Department of Sociology and Anthropology, the Anthropological and Sociological Initiatives of the Ateneo, and the Arete and its Eduardo J. Aboitis Sandbox Zone. So today we have the great pleasure and privilege to have Dr. Hari Vidianto to open our web webinar series. Dr. Vidianto is a research professor at the Research Center for Prehistoric Archaeology of the National Research and Innovation Agency in Indonesia. He began his career in archaeology with a bachelor's degree in 1983 at Gajamada University in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. He then obtained a master's degree in 1990 and a PhD in 1993 in paleoanthropology at the Institute of Human Paleontology of the National Museum of Natural History in Paris, France. Dr. Vidianto focuses on the study of the evolutionary processes from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens in the Indonesian archipelago, conducting investigations and excavations in caves and open sites of Pleistocene and Holocene age. He was born and raised on the island of Java, and so it seems fitting that he became a site director of Sangiran. And Sangiran is among the most famous and outstanding sites for the study of our earliest history and many important fossil remains of Homo erectus and other human ancestors have been discovered there by Dr. Vidianto and his team. Harry is a prolific writer who has authored over 110 publications in the form of books and articles in proceedings and journals. And he is a, one of the few modern day scientists in the world who successfully spanned the bridge between archeology span and paleontology. Now there's, there's a lot more to say about the work and achievements of Professor Vidianto. And I will leave this to Mylene who is a good friend of Harry and has approached him to give a talk for our webinar. So thank you for that, Mylene. And I hand over the microphone to you now. Thank you, Alfred. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Dr. Harry Widianto eventually became one of the esteemed professors of the International Master and Doctorate in Quaternary and Prehistory of the Erasmus Mundus program a program which in turn has produced dozens of Southeast Asian and European scholars specializing in the many subtopics of quaternary and prehistory. Dr. Widianto's work is a testament to science serving broader human concerns. Uh, while he has generated voluminous research on the prehistory of Indonesia, he has authored a number of books that are meant for public consumption. Uh, and one of them is Sangiran, the breath of hominid sites, um, the English version of which I uh, co-edited in 2012. As a scientist, uh, Dr. Widianto has shown commitment to the larger context of cultural heritage and its management. Uh, in October 2017, while he was head of the Directorate of Cultural Property and Museums of the Ministry of Education and Culture of the Republic of Indonesia, we had the chance once again to collaborate on a project with the Georgian Embassy in Jakarta and the Georgian National Museum entitled The Joint Exhibition of Prehistoric Heritage, which brought together the Indonesian and Georgian Homo erectus at the Indonesia National Museum. It is an honor to have you with us as we kick off this series with top experts in human evolution. Harry, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. You are welcome. You are welcome. 
Yeah. I'll turn you over now to Dr. Fuentes, who will give us uh, an idea what the talk is going to be about. Rick? And good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Maylene. Today's talk is about the site of Sangiran in central Java, which was first presented to the scientific world by GHR von Konigswald in 1934. Has, has since its discovery made an immense contribution to the history of mankind from the early Pleistocene onwards. The information obtained from the site is very extensive and mainly related to the human culture, fauna, and environmental evolution during the last two million years. The geological structure of the site indicates that only 40% of its area has been exposed only in the upper part of the Sangiran Dome, while about 60% of the human evidence is still buried underneath in layers dating back to at least 1.5 million years. For this reason, the Sangiran site is like a never-ending story of humankind at the moment. Most of the research being conducted at the site nowadays constantly yields new discoveries and consequently raises new questions and perceptions. This presentation is about the site itself, its significance for human evolution, and the latest research with its new interpretation. So again, we welcome Dr. Harry Widianto. The floor is now yours. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I would like to express my thanks to the Ateneo de Manila University. In this case, it was presented uh, by uh, Dr. Alfred Walik and also my good friend, Mylene, yeah, that first uh, contacted few, yeah, a few months ago. And for this case, I said directly, yes, I will give a talk on the series of webinar from the Manila University. And in this, yeah, in this case, I would like to presence about the famous site of Sangiran in Central Java. And the title of the presentation is The Unfinished Story for the Humankind. So I will directly go to the screen. Yeah, I will share my screen. Yes, I hope you can see Emma presentation, yeah? And yes. the title is Sangiran Site, The Unfinished Story. Why we call the site as an unfinished story, I will explain, of course, yeah. Yeah, for the background, historical background, I would like to talk about uh, the even some hundreds years ago, yeah, about a hundred years ago, when we know about this gentleman, Eugene Dubois, yeah. when he start his uh, travel from the Netherlands to the, at the time we call Netherlands India for Indonesian region for the discovery of missing link of Darwin's evolution theory at the time. Yeah. So in his mind of Dubois, Darwin said that uh, the link between ape and man can be found in the area, even in the tropical area, which is a very 
good environments for the great apes to live at the time during thousands and million years. So even though the Netherlands India, which is Indonesia, what we call now, Nusantara Archipelago, after he communicated with uh, Alfred Russell Wallace and also Darwin himself at the time, when Darwin makes a travel from uh, England, United Kingdom to Galapagos in South America uh, during uh, five years from 1825 until 1830 and always talk with Alfred Russell Wallace, which is at the time he stays in Halmahera in Eastern Indonesia to have some informations about the natural environments of Indonesian island at the time. So after he talked very, very long with Alfred Russell Wallace, said that this is a very good region where we can find many, many primates on the islands. And at the time, Dubois planned to make a travel from the Netherlands to Netherlands, India, Indonesia at the time. In 80, 87, yeah, October 29, he started his journey to Indonesia on the SS Princess Amalia. And first arrived, he was in West Sumatra. He was in West Sumatra and he continued to excavate some caves in the Bukit Barisan mountains in Payakumbu, West Sumatra. At least three caves he excavated, but the material, the human bones only represented by a modern human, not a very ancient between ape and man like he is. Why he make excavations on the cave? Because at the time he heard that the Neanderthals live in the cave and it is something like hominid with a very archaic characteristic of the skull. So when he arrived in Indonesia, he entered to the caves following what Neanderthal has discovered in Europe. But three caves he excavated in Payakumbu in West Sumatra only gave a very subreason fossils, not uh, perfect fossils, and represents only modern human anatomy. In the third year of his excavations in the West Sumatra, he heard about the discovery of Wajak men in East Java, in Tulungagung. So at last he moved his excavations to Java. And fortunately in Wajak Kiv, he discovered the second skull of Wajak. But again, Wajak is also modern human skull, not different with us, but it is very mineralized and has underwent a perfect fossilization, a fossilization because it was uh, deposited in the cave of Mar. 
So the mineral come inside to the bones and then even it is a modern humans, but the structure of the skull has already fossilized, well fossilized. And after that, he get out from the cave and he follow a river Bengawan Solo in East Java around Madiun. And finally, he recognized that in the slope of the Bengawan Solo River, we can find a real fossils of the animals. So Bengawan Solo Rivers has resulted a sediments containing the fossils, many, many fossils. And Dubois said that in Java, the orientations to look for the fossils, not on the cave, like in Europe, but we have to try to find in the open side, yeah, like Bengawan Solo. And then after that, he arrived in a very small village in East Java near the Bengawan Solo, what we call Trinil. And he makes, when the river was dried, he makes the excavations on the bed of the river. And the stratigraphy is permitted by the Cabo formation. Yeah, they did it to Middle Pleistocene about 500,000 years ago. And he is very lucky because in 1981, he found what we call Peter Cantropus erectus, represented mainly by a skull cap and also a femur, left femur, human femur. And he called this discovery as Pithecos means ape, Anthropos means human, and Erectus because the Vimmer show a uh, signification of the uh, bipedal, bipedal. So he names the discovery with the Canthropus erectus. We can see here from the side, yeah, the inclinations on the front runner is very, very important here. And this, uh, what we call torus orbiter, yeah, orbital torus, and have a very long skull cap with low skull cap also here. In the occipital, we can see a very sharp angulation here. Yeah. And from the above, we can see here a sulcus supra thoralis, yeah. and also the constrictions yeah, on the, the orbit. Yeah. So the capacity of the skull is about 900 centimeter cubes. This is the volume between ape. The biggest one is 650. And human, the small one is 100 and uh, 1,200. So nine, 900 is between ape and man also. And from the skull, it was very, very archaic and he believed that the femur separated about 15 matters from the skull belongs to the same individual because the femur show the same color and the same degree of fossilization. So he said that the femurs belong to the Pithecanthropus and that's why he said the name of the Discovery is Pithecanthropus erectus. So after that, he placed the paleoanthropology in Indonesia. Means that paleoanthropology was born at the time 
in 1891 in Indonesia. And this is the first Homo erectus discovery found in the world. Because at the time, yeah, no discovery about this specimen. And actually, in Kedubrubus, not very far from Trinil, in 1890, he discovered a fragments of the mandible yeah, in the symphysis regions with the incisive and also the socket of the canine. Yeah, yeah. But he still keep it after he discovered Peter Cantopus erectus in Trinil, he said or he named this fragment of mandible as Peter Cantropus A. Yeah. It was discovery one year before Dubois found the famous Pithecanthropus erectus. And after that, after Trinil, after Kodogrubus, in the end of 19th century, we have many, many hominid sites in Java Island, especially in Central and East Java. I will show you very fast here. This is the first discovery from Ngandong, Central Java, not far from Sangiran, in 1931. Yeah. We have in the meander of Bengawan Solo River, excavated the sites, and we have 11 skull of the progressive Homo erectus, the youngest ones, live in Java as a last Homo erectus, some 250 until 150,000 years ago. This is the last Homo erectus ever lived in Java. You can see here, very round skull, but still yeah, very sharp angulations and also still retained the torus here, but it is very high. Yeah? the capacity, cranial capacity of about one thousand and a hundred centimeter cube. And after that, in 1931 and uh, 34, Sangiran was discovered. And during the last, uh, the, the, the first two years from 1936 until 1938, there are about eight fragments of Homo erectus. The oldest one, the oldest one, yeah, from 1.5 million years ago. And we have Sangiran 4. The cranial capacity is about 870 centimeter cubes, and it has a very thick cranial bones, yeah. And in the brechma, sometimes it reaches about 1.2 centimeters, yeah, thick. And we have a very strong jaws and also very big teeth here. This is the oldest one. What I said as archaic Homo erectus. They live in Java about 1.5 until uh, 0.8 million years ago. And also this one is coming from the same layer in the middle part of uh, black clay of Puchangan formations in Sangiran. And we have what we call Sangiran 6 here, Megandropus paleojavanicus, and Sangiran 1b, Sangiran 9, and so on and so on. So from Sangiran, most of the mandibles came from the lower Pleistocene, lower Pleistocene. And after that, we have also the second stage of evolution of Homo erectus in Sangiran, what we call Sangiran 2 and so on and so on. And this is the most complete Sangiran 17. We can see the cast in all museum in the world. Yeah? And this uh, Sangiran 2 and so on and so on will be called typical Homo erectus. This is the majority of discovery Homo erectus in Java and also in Sangiran. So the carnal capacity 
is about a uh, dozen centimeter cube and the skull is higher and also more rounded or more rounding than uh, typical uh, archaic Homo erectus. And this type live in uh, Sangiran about 730 until 300 dozens years ago. And this is Mochokropa site discovered in 1936. We have only up to now one skull about seven until uh, five until seven years old. So this is the child, but the child has a uh, show a very long and very, yeah, strong constrictions as uh, post orbit here. And also the occipital is still sharp. Yeah, we can see, see the constrictions and we have also the torus supra orbitalis here. Yeah. So this is represented of representations of a uh, Homo erectus Charles, which is five until seven years old. Yeah, and from the stratigraphy, it could be one point eight million years ago, because it was sedimented in the very volcanic uh, gravels and dated to 1.8, according to uh, Swisser and also Professor Jacob. And after that, in 1974, in Sabu near Sangiran also, we have uh, three skulls from progressive Homo erectus, the youngest one. Yeah. And after that, we have uh, Pati Ayam, discovered in 1979. Yeah, only some small fragment of the cranial and one premolar discovered by Professor Sartono and Professor Saib. This is coming from Middle Pleistocene. And Ngawi in 1987 in East Java. This is representations of uh, progressive omeritus. Yeah just like Ngandong and also Sambung Macan one. And Rancah in West Java, what we call Rancah Hominid one, according to Kramer et al, 2004, they excavated the site and finally they found in situ an incisive, yeah. And this is human. And the dating is about 600 until 500 by Argon, Argon, yeah. So they assigned this incisifus to Homo erectus. This is very important, even though only one fit, but because it is discovered in the excavations with a precise stratigraphy. Yeah, this is something like uh, yeah, very important things because most of the discovery in Java belongs to the surface find or out of stratigraphy context. So when we found the discovery on the excavations with a clear stratigraphy, it is very good for us. And after that, 2005, we have a semido. You can see here, a frontal and frontal here, and also two occipital, uh, two uh, parietal, left and right. And this is the bone of the occipital. Yeah. Uh, very strong attached to the concretions here volcanic material. When I compare to Grokolwetan from Sangiran here, yeah, dated to 700 and, uh, 730 thousand years ago, it is very similar 
Yeah. So you can see here the occipital and also the frontal here. And this is uh, the temporal left and right here. Yeah? And I think this is uh, the two discovery is the same states of evolution of Homo erectus about 700,000 years ago. This is coming from Smedo one. And we have in uh, Brebes, what we call Pumiayu. Normally the site was investigated by Stahlin, Van der Marl, and also Konigswald in 1925 until 1930. But at the time, Konix4 has already formulated the, the oldest fauna from Java, yeah? what we call Jijulang fauna and also Kaligalaga fauna. And after that, after a yeah, long period since Van der Marl and Konigswald investigated this area, we found in 2019, two fragment of uh, caput femoralis here. And this is completed by, with uh, the emphasis of uh, femur. Yeah, Very small, but important because this is the first human discovery from this Bumiayu sites. Yeah. And yeah, after we identified, we measured, we analyzed from the metric and also morphological uh, characteristic. Finally, we found that the two uh, fragments come from the caput femoralis of the femur and also the aphysis of femur here. Yeah. And related to the material and also stratigraphic and geological investigations mixed by several sections in some places from the site. Finally, he said that the discovery belongs in the levels of the this Kaligaka formations in the lower part of Kaligaka formations about 1.8 million years ago. So after the discovery of Semedo, Rancha, and also from Bumiayu, we have a group of sites, how many sites in the West here? Because traditionally, we only see the distributions of how many sites in the East here, yeah? in the Eastern of Central Java, and also some site located in the East Java. So since 2019, we have to look for uh, to look at to the west, yeah, to look at to the west. So the distributions of the Homo erectus is not in this part, but also in the west part. And all we talk about is concerning Homo erectus. How can we arrive in Java? Yeah. We believe that out of Africa part one, 1 1.8 is the, 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 the beginning yeah. when they migrate to the Eastern area and to China, to India, and at last 1.5 million ago, uh, they arrived to Java in Sangiran, for example. And we believe also that during the glaciations, the migration took place because at the time we have uh, land bridges yeah, during the ice age that connected the island to the Southeast Asia continental. And we believe that during the glaciations, Homo erectus walk from Africa to Java.
Here. And you can see here, here. Now, now this, the root of migration, we, we think that uh, the root of migration from Africa to Java now is, yeah, under the sea, yeah, between Sumatra and also Borneo, Kalimantan here. But during the glaciations, they can migrate from Africa and arrive to Java, for example, in Sangiran, some 1 million and five, uh, 1.5 million years ago. Now I will talk about the Sangiran itself. Yeah. yeah. As I said before, Sangiran is an open area, yeah, located between the two volcanoes. UNESCO said called the site as Sangiran Element Sites. And I add some words to homeland of Java men because we have many, many Homo erectus discovered from the site. Up to now, we have more than a hundred individuals, individuals of Homo erectus from the site. Mm -hmm. And this is the site of Sangiran. In the West, we have what we call Merapi Volcano. Yeah. And before I uh, talk to Mylene that uh, Merapi Volcano is one of the most active, uh, the most active volcanoes in the world. Yeah. And up to now, yeah, the last one week, still erupted, still many, many volcanic materials uh, was delivered to the village surroundings, the volcano. And in the east, we have also Lawu volcano here. So Sangiran located in the big solo depressions here. It's very, very yeah, deep here. And it received during two million years ago, the material volcanics, both from Lavu Volcano and also from Merapi Volcano. And Sangiran Ilsef now is limited with this brown Limes, yeah, uh, covers an area of 56 kilometers square. This is eight kilometers, and this one is seven kilometers. Yeah. So in the middle of the sites, there is a Chamorro River. Yeah. This is the branch of Pengawan Solo here, and this is ancient river also. Yeah. So you can see the very old sediments on this river yeah. separated from Saragen Regency and also Karanganyar Regency. And this one located exactly under the museum of Sangiran here. And we see this is Lahar of the Pucangan formations, the lower level of Pucangan formations, and this lahar dated to 1.8 million years ago. So the museum itself was built on the lahar. It is very hard and there is no discovery. And you can see also everywhere in Sangiran, this is the sedimentation of the volcanic sands. Yeah. Sometimes it's reached about 40 meters thick, yeah, 40 meters thick. And this uh, formations uh, layers is very, very rich in human fossils, in artifacts, and also 
in animal fossils and animal fossils. So the Kabu formations is above the Puchan formations dated to about 700 until 300 dozen years ago, full of the discovery here. And this is the environments of the uh, evolutions of Sangiran sites. Yeah. The first one is uh, here in the base. We have a blue clay from Kalibang formations like this. And this is the witness when Sangiran at the time is still marine environment. Yeah. And it was uh, dominated by uh, blue clay of Kalibang formations. And the dated the thing is about 2.4 until 1.8. And after that, we have a volcanic material. The first volcanic material is was lahar, lahar from the Puchangan uh, formation here that I show you that this is the base of the museum now. And after that, about yeah, 1.7, it was yeah, changed. Yeah into the swim environment, yeah, swim environment. So all the material is black clay from Pujan formations. And this is, yeah, until about 900 dozen years ago. So after that, we have a Grand Spang, means the border between Pujan formations and also Kapu formations. And this is the first continental Layers, yeah, the first continental layers deposited in the Sangiran side. So the depositions of Grand Spang has makes the marine environment, swim environment disappear from the side. And it is changed into the continental, yeah, continental, with many, many uh, volcanic, with many volcanic uh, material here. And this is the golden age of Sangiran from 700 until 250 dozen years ago. This is, we have many Homo erectus, typical Homo erectus, almost kind of fossil animals. Yeah, and also the artifact, they develop a very, very strong artifact. Yeah, so we can see artifact in the surface, also the human skull and also uh, animal fossils. Yeah. And this is the flu, flu view volcanic sand yeah, from Kabu formations and changed from Swan swam environment into continental environments. But after that, again, the lahar deposited in this uh, level, and this is Notopura formations, yeah, with a volcanic, again, material here, but difference from Kabu formations, that from the structure of stratigraphy of this profile volcanic, it was deposited in Sangiran by water, by river. Yeah. So we interpreted by also the, uh, the evidence of palynology during the formations of Kabu, uh, during the Kabu formations, about 700 until 250. Sangiran is an open forest, open forest with many, many rivers. And this is the golden age of uh, yeah, Sangiran, the golden age. Yeah. And from this one, we have also the volcanic material from the two volcanoes, but there is no water inside. So at the time, maybe the Notopura formations was dominated by stepa, by tundra. Yeah. So the human at the time has already moved and they leave Sangiran because uh, the environment is not uh, 
favorable for 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 them. So they leave Sangiran and they move to the Bengawan Solo River in the east. Yeah. So the fossils Homo erectus about 200 and 150 years ago, no more discovered in Sangiran, but in the eastern sites along the Bengawan Solo, like Sambung Macan, Ngawi, and also uh, Ngandong. Yeah? And because they, they have already uh, lived Sangiran, because uh, uh, it's not very good for, for them. So this is the environment evolution. Yeah? We can see on the site very clear with a kind of lithology of stratigraphy like this. Yeah? And the dating is very, very advanced in Sangiran, well dated, all uh, states of uh, stratigraphy here. And this is the formations of the Sangiran Dome up to now. For example, this is the blue one is uh, Kalibang formations when Sangiran still uh, on the sea. Yeah? And after that, Sangiran changed to the swim area with the depositions of uh, black clay of Puchangan formations until about uh, 800,000 years ago. And this is the first continental layers and continental layers, Kabu formations, continental layers, also uh, Notopuro formations. And after that, some 150,000 years ago, there was Indukin movement on the center here, and also Exokin from the left and also the right. So makes the flat Sangiran side became something like a dome. That's why Sangiran is very famous with the name of Sangiran Dome. So you can see all is folded like this. Yeah. And about a hundred thousand years ago, there was a very giant erosions on the top of the side. Yeah. So this is the erosions. Makes the surface up to now is very, very old sediments here. You can see here, this is 2.4 thousand years ago. And this is about 1.8 until 100, uh, 1 million years ago. And this is Kabu formation, 700. So when we stand here near the museum, you can uh, step down on the surface with 2.4 million years ago. So this is the center. When we look to the north, when we look to the south or east, more and more, we have a younger and younger stratigraphy here. This one is about 200 and 100,000 years ago. And this one is 2.4 until 1.8 million years ago. So this is the, 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 the formations of uh, Sangiran. And if we look at from the above, you can see this is the marine environments and this is swim environment with yellow. Yeah. Most of the, the oldest Homo erectus come from this black clay of Puchang rivers. And the green one is Kabu formation here. Yeah, most of the Homo erectus and also artifact coming from these layers. And the other one is Notopuro. Up to now, we have no human fossils, but only a small, small quantity of uh, animal fossils from this Notopuro. Yeah. Sangirans came to light to scientific. And this is, yeah, the age of Pithecanthropus from Van S. Yeah, when we want, when he wants to investigate it, the age of Pithecanthropus, one day he arrived in Sangiran and he makes the first 
map of the Sangiran now about three kilometers from the museum, yeah, Pagerjo. And this is the first map of Sangiran area at the time. And after that, when Konigsworth arrived to the site, he discovered Sangiran flex industry, very small flex made from uh, Calcedoni, Calcedon, yeah. And it was discovered on the surface. Konigsworth at the time said that this is the implements of the Homo erectus. It was in 1934. And he said that one day we will find Homo erectus from Sangiran. It is declared as Homo in how many sites by Konigsworth in 1934. And this is his, yeah, his staff. Konigsworth <laughs> at the time in Bandung, about uh, 300 kilometers from Sangiran. And he asked for Lurah, the uh, chief on the village, to maintain all the discovery, fossil discovery from Sangiran. And after that, Mbah Toto Marsono, he prepared his house to gather all fossils from surrounding area. But more and more, his house became very small because full of fossils. And he placed the museums into the first museum of Sangiran in the office of the Krikilan village. Yeah. He is the chief and he used the office as the museums of the Sangiran area at the time. And the predictions of Konigswald is very, very good because two years after he declared the sites in 1936 and 1938, we found many, many human fossils from the sites all coming from Puchangan formations, black clay of Puchangan formations, dated to 1.5 million years ago. Yeah, this is the first discovery from Sangiran. And now Sangiran 1 until Sangiran, for example, is Sangiran 1, Sangiran 2, 3, 4, 4, yeah, 4, this is 6, uh, 5, 6, 7, uh, 11. Yeah, 11. All material was uh, housed in Frankfurt Second Bear Museum. This is the Konigswald office at the time. And also after that, we have uh, some more specimens from the lower Pleistocene, some animals, and in 1971, we have uh, very good specimens of Homo erectus. Yeah. Sangiran 17. And this is the only specimens with face, yeah, because we have uh, yeah, face of Homo erectus. And Sangiran 21, Ramen of Mandible with uh, third molar, 22, almost complete. The fit here. And this is archaic Homo erectus. The oldest one, this is archaic Homo erectus from the mandibles and typical Homo erectus from skull. And it is not in Sangiran, but other sites in the east of Sangiran, progressive Homo erectus. So when we talk about the evolutions of Homo erectus Java, we have three stages, the archaic one, typical one, and also the progressive one. Yes, the last Homo erectus live in Java and disappear from the island about 150,000 years ago and replaced by the anatomical modern human. And this is evolution, almost the same. Yeah. And from the human evolution, Sangiran has. Uh, 
many, many evidence for three, uh, at least two states of evolution from Homo erectus, from archaic into typical one. And after that, we have uh, outside Sangiran, the progressive Homo erectus. And the unfinished story of humankind. Why? Why? Yeah, because up to now, we still have many, many discoveries. We can see that the discovery of human skull or human bones is increasing. And also we have many, many up to now, animal bones and also the artifact. So all the material still buried in the ancient depositions of Sangaran site up to now. Yeah. Here we have only 40 percent, but most of the discovery still buried in the sediments of the Sangiran. So when we have an erosion because of the hot rain, so the material is volcanic material and it is very easy to erode. Yeah. So from the erosions, normally we can find a new discovery from the site. So the exposed area from Sangran itself now is only 40% and still we have 60% buried in the ancient sediments of the Sangiran. So still have uh, a future research, yeah, future discovery. And for example, this one, fauna discovery, we have uh, Elephas cinematicus, we have also Stigudon, we have also Mastodon, yeah, and some uh, Bofidae here. This is the local people who has already a uh, big contributions to the museums when he found, for example, this one, bus, yeah, head of the bus, Palusun Daikus, yeah, and he gave the discovery to the museum. What we call Pak Senior, Pak Senior, yeah, very, very famous in Sangiran site because. Yeah, he often discover and give it to the museum. For example, this one, yeah. the material attached to the fossils can inform about the relative chronology of the finds. For example, this one is very typical Kapu formation sediments attached to the fossils. So this one, I clean only half of the skull and I still leave the material to be attached to the specimens. If I clean all, because this boss is living from lower Pleistocene until uh, upper Pleistocene here. So I cannot uh, estimate uh, relatively uh, what is the edge of uh, the skull? Yeah, but with the material attached, still attached to the specimens, I can see that this is couple formations from middle Pleistocene and live at least a hundred, uh, five hundred thousand years ago. Yeah, just for examples. And this is in the museum of Sangiran. We have a display a real fossils yeah in the diorama here yeah. and just like this one is uh, Procodilus from Kabu formations in the lower part about 700,000 years ago and it has a very complete almost complete fit yeah of the the this is a good specimens because uh, we have uh, almost intact skull with uh, many many feet inside yeah and in sangiran we have uh, for example gavialis here 
and also crocodilus. Yeah, most of the finds of the uh, crocodiles uh, from coming from these two species. And we have a uh, complete uh, material from the elephant, from stegodon, from elepha, uh, from mastodon, 1.5 from stegodon, and also from elephas. And this is the reasons elephants live in Sumatra, for example. So when Sumatra elephant wants to trace their ancestor, they can go to Sangiran and they will find Mastodon, Stegodon, and also Elephas Namadikus uh, live and very, very in big quantity here in Sangiran. So we can, if anyone wants to make uh, research about the evolutions of the elephant, you can go to Sangiran. And this is Hippopotamus, yeah, discover in one place consists of 109 pieces of uh, bones of the hippopotamus. It is very, very uh, super, very good because in Sangiran normally, all the discovery was stretched on the surface. Yeah. And we found only, uh, only pieces from pieces. But in Bukuran site, in the east of Sangiran Dome, we excavated in 1990. This is uh, Truman Simanjutak and also Francois Simas. And they arrived to the collections in one place, 110 bone of hippopotamus. So uh, they begin to reconstruct uh, like this and present it in the museum. And for the animal, Sangiran have uh, very good illustrations of the evolutions. For example, the elephant from Mastodon, Stegodon, and also Elephas, and also Hippopotamus here, yeah, and Cervidae, and also yeah, Bovidae. But the rhinoceros is only presented in Sangiran since the middle Pleistocene here, yeah, and also Sus. And the evolution of fauna in Sangiran, about yeah, 1.8 dozen years ago. Artifact crisis here. Normally, they said that Sangiran is very famous with Sangiran flex industry. This is flex industry like this, very small from Chalcedony. Yeah. But recently, we have. Uh, Massive tools here. We have bola, we have chopper, we have cleaver, we have also pointed leaves here like this. Yeah. So Sangiran is not only uh, by Sangiran flex industry, but we have massive tool also in Sangiran. For example, here when Truman Siman Juntak excavated at Banyarejo, he arrived in the cultural layer and he has an uh, assemblage of uh, fauna fossils and also cultural elements here. And we have uh, not only flicks here. Yeah? So this is something like Ashulian type yeah? discovered on the excavations about 700,000 years ago. And about 25 meters from the location here, in the same layer, we have a skull of Grogolwetan. Skull of Grogolwetan, Homo erectus, about 700,000 years ago. So this is very important layers that gives the human, gives the artifacts, and also gives the fossils animal in Sangiran. And In my mind, I think for the, the artifact, yeah, most of them, for example, Sangiran Flex industry itself, was discovered on the surface out of stratigraphical context. Yeah. The important one for me to have the idea about the age of the artifact of Sangiran must be 
discover in the stratigraphical context from yeah 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 from from the excavation from the excavation so most of them from the surface is very difficult to decide what is the age of the sangiran artifact so i began in 1996 to dig in several layers of sangiran just to discover the implements stone tools on the stratigraphical <laughs> context the first one i have an impression back of flex and massive tools in this level yeah notable formations about 225,000 years ago from these divisions and after that yeah in the kabu formations and also in the grange bank in ngledok tanjung and also dayu we have a flex this is grange bank yeah they did to 800,000 years ago so i believe that this flex it is at least 800,000 years ago. And after that, we have the most archaic human fossils of Hemeritus from this part. But at that time, we don't have any cultural evidence. The typical has already proved with the discovery from Ngeledok and also Kudung Dawa River. But the oldest one here, we don't have any, any evidence of their implements, tools. Yeah. Yeah. So I began to concentrate to excavate in this level where most of the archaic Homo erectus are found in black clay of Puchangan formation here, about 100.5 million years ago. So, Homeros archaic from the lower places of Sangran, where is their culture? This is yeah, my, my question at the time. Yeah. And I begin to excavate in the Black clay of Puchangan. Yeah. This is the black clay of Puchangan, where the archaic Homo erectus coming from this layer. Yeah. And after that, we have this one. This is black clay of Puchangan, at least one million years ago. And we have a uh, 3.7 meter sticks under the Puchangan black clay. This layer, this is the uh, volcanic layers, ancient river deposits. Yeah. And this is the excavation. Black clay of Puchangan where the oldest Homo erectus used to be discovered in this layer. And this is the river, ancient river deposits. And this is about this level from the dating from the feet of uh, Buffett, we have 1.2 million years ago for this. This is very gradual. So that is not uh, undisturbed uh, stratigraphy. This is very uh, smooth depositions of the stratigraphy. Yeah. So from this layer in the square of three meters, three meters with 1.5 flakes, we have 220 flakes. Yeah. Very, very yeah, abundant. And here, the flakes. Yeah. I do believe that the oldest stone tools ever found in Indonesia 
1.2 million years ago. And this is very typical Sangiran flex industry. So Sangiran flex industry is, was presented in Sangiran since 1.2 until 100 dozen years ago. Yeah, 100. And I believe this is the artifact of Homo erectus of the lower Pleistocene. So this is uh, appear in science. Yeah. And from cultural evolutions, we have from 1.2 until about 100 dozen years ago. And it is not only small implements like uh, flakes, but also the massive tools here, yeah, the massive tools here. And Sangiran itself, yeah, it's a reflection of sedimentation for more than 2 million years, yeah, uninterrupted. So it continued from 2 million up to 100,000 years ago. Even here is uh, recent uh, sedimentation here. And the outstanding value of the Sangiran, one of human evolution sites in the world, covering a story of humankind more than 1.5 with some individual uh, hundred Homo erectus from lower Pleistocene to middle Pleistocene. Figuring for now evolution is more than 1.8. Representing cultural evolution since at least 1 million years ago by Sangharaf industry and massive tools. Those cultural material were deposited within its natural context. Yeah, this is important, yeah? And from geological point of view, the sites of our unique opportunity in studying an environment evolution on a quiet last horizon scale during the last 2.4 million years ago. And this is important also. Today, there are still more human and animal fossils, as well as stone tools, deep buried on the site. So we still have uh, many, many uh, hope to continue the research in Sangiran because, yeah, inscribed into UNESCO since 1996. And I will give you some uh, uh, research, recent research here. And this is a small, small river in the dry seasons, yeah, in Bojong. It's not, but during the wet seasons, it will be very, very dangerous because. <laughs> the deepest of the water is will very, very strong here. And on the base of the Drat River, we can see a small Grinsbang fragment. Grinsbang fragment. So we have a Grinsbang here, layers. And this is the level of about 900 dozen years ago from the Grinsbang. And we can find also a uh, half posterior part of Homo erectus here. You can see here. And inside, the skull was filled with Grinspang. So I believe that the first sedimentations of the fossils was Grinspang, means that these fossils at least has an age about 900,000 years ago. Yeah. Grinsbang is very, very hard. Yeah. And you can see this one is very thick. Yeah. This one, this, the, the, the bones is very thick. This is from superior uh, view. And this is on posterior view, lateral. And as only this is the base. Was discovered 2019. Oh. And this is my excavations in 2019 also that I said it is not very far from the museum. Yeah, only 200 in the north of the museum, the present museum. And this is eroded. And the people there was uh, used for the cultivations of uh, rice. Yeah. And this uh, level of stratigraphy 
is something uh, here about 1.87 dozen uh, 1.7 million years ago yeah because this stratigraphy is only two meters from the lower lahar of Sangiran. Yeah, yeah, of the Puchang formation. So this surface is about located here and I mix excavations. Yeah, the excavations. This is the black clay of Puchangan. Yeah, evidently, because I dig in the lower part of black clay of Puchangan dated to 1.7 million years ago. And at last, we found a fragment, a very, very small fragment, yeah. But uh, it was uh, discovered during the excavations and this one. Yeah. This is a fragment of... Uh, Pubic bones, human pubic bones here. Something like here. Yeah, this is one. And this is uh, some view. This is uh, coming from this level here. This level with the dating of tough two of TUF2 and TUF3, yeah. And this is about 1.8 and TUF3 is 1.6, yeah, million years ago. And we have on the level 1.7 million years ago. So the dating of the pubic coming from the excavations is 1.7 million ago years ago. And the other discovery is a femur and premolar of a tiger. Yeah. It is also discovered and well attached to the stratigraphy of black clay. And this is the reconstruction. And we have also a premolar here. And John DeVos Z. That this is a very giant tiger live in Sangiran, and the dating is 1.7 million years ago. So before we see that the tiger coming in Sangiran connected to the trinil fauna about one million years ago. So this excavations has proved us that the tiger is 700 dozen years earlier than expected so far. Yeah. So the first tiger in Sangiran arrived 1.7. The same with the human, the oldest human at the time. And I continue to Dozens and 21 with the same locations. I continue. And this is my team. Yeah. You can see some people. This is the museum. Not very far, 200 meters. And this is study gravity. Almost the same with 219. This is tooth three. Yeah, tooth three. Tooth three is 1.6 million years ago, the dating. Yeah. And this is uh, what what do we call it, yeah? This is uh, the feet of uh, fish from the swamp, from the uh, black clay, uh, catfish, catfish, yeah, catfish. 
we call ikan lili, yeah, catfish. And from the yeah, we have many many thick catfish like this. So I think that uh, sometimes we don't care about the small animals, the fossils. But uh, from the excavations, we have uh, that catfish has already arrived also in Sanginan 1.7 million years ago. Yeah. And this is the Crocodilus siamensis, Crocodilus siamensis. And the chronology of the Homo erectus in Sangiran must be placed here, an archaic Homo erectus from 1.7. And until 0.9. Yeah, so this is the new dates of the human fossils from the Sangiran. Before we have 1.5, now we have 1.7. And also for the tiger, turtle, and also crocodile, we have a new evidence here. We have to place them in 1.7. Seven million years ago. Yeah. So, biochronology of Sangiran must be revised. At least we can see that uh, the tiger arrived in Java is not one million years ago by Trinil fauna, but they have already arrived in Sangiran 1.7. And also the crocodile and also turtle. When we said that Sangiran before is 1.5, and also the theory of uh, out of Africa, part two, they move from Africa about 1.8, and they arrive in Sangiran, for example, 1.5. It is very logic. They need hundreds, dozens years to migrate from Africa to Sangiran. But up to now, we have a new evidence. Even though it's very small, or big fragment, human fragment, but it is very important again because it was discovered in the stratigraphical context in the excavations. One point seven million years ago. And in Bumiayu, we have also 1.7 and 1.8 million years ago. In Dominasi, Georgi, 1.8. Longupo, 1.8. So we have to consider, again, the migration theory out of Africa. Or we have to think over about the possibility of multi-regional theory. Yeah. It's not maybe from Africa to migrate to several places in the world, but the dating in the world of Homo erectus, they have a similar dated, but 1.8. So we have to consider is out of Africa must be Written or maybe multi regional is the second migration theory. It's not migration, but local evolutions must be considered about the emergence of Homo erectus in some parts in the world. And in fact, yeah. We still have many, many discovery in Sangiran yeah, science, yeah. time to time, and over, and over making a new story of humankind as well. And Sangiran seems like the unfinished story, and maybe it will be a never-ending research, because we still have many, many evidence on the site up to now. Thank you very much. So, Avrat, I give now to you. Thank you very much. And 
I can, yeah, if there is any question. Okay. I will stop. Okay. Thank you so much, Harry. Thank You're you welcome. for that wonderful and, and very rich uh, lecture about this amazing place. So 100 years, that's not enough huh, to excavate Shakaran. <laughs> <laughs> not yeah. even close and and as you, you, you showed it so beautifully in, in, in one of the graphs that that Sangira and the dome is is really literally a window into the past and into the entire quaternary yeah so the, this is uh, this is one of the most outstanding things that that uh, would come to my mind when, when I think about Sangira so this is quite amazing um I think we we have uh, one or two questions, and uh, I think we still have time uh, for them. Uh, Edo, may I uh, give it to you? Um, yes, we, we do have one question. I, I think he or she is just curious. It's from Mr. or Ms. Uh, Bati, Batiao, and I think it's about the policies in Indonesia. He or but, she asked the policies, and he or she asked, may I ask if there is a law in Indonesia that protects the human or animal fossils against illegal trading? No, no, uh, uh, it's not very clear. Can, can you speak loudly, please? Okay. Um, our participant asks, may I ask if there is a law in Indonesia that protects the human or animal fossils against illegal trading. Yes, I'm not very clear there. Mylene, uh, can you? I, yeah, I, I think the question is about trading in fossils. Is there a law prohibiting uh, the trade or I guess buying and selling of fossils in Indonesia? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, fossils and also the artifacts, for example, yeah, it's regarded as a cultural heritage for us because we have a law. We have a law, uh, number 11, year 2010, who protect all the cultural materials like heritage. Yeah, so we have uh, the regulations and the fossils is very protected because it is include one of the cultural heritage. Why? Because it represents about the science, it represents about the history, and it represents about the cultural itself. So it is very, very strong to be included in the cultural heritage and it was protected nationally by the law yeah all the actions yeah, contradictions with the law will be punished from the articles of this 2011 the law number 11 to dozens so including everything human fossils artifacts and also animal fossils. All the evidence of the life in the past related to science, all the evidence about the history, yeah? all the evidence about the cultural heritage. So fully, absolutely protected by the law. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Is there another question? May I ask a question? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you. You, you, uh, you showed in your presentation, Harry, that you have been finding more fossils recently. Uh, why is that? Is this a function of technology being available and making it easier to find fossils or is it now the culture of the locals or, or, 
or you know the the, the new crop of of uh, archaeologists and scientists that you have developed that are finding more fossils in in uh, in excavation, or is it a combination of both? Yeah, yeah. The facts that we have discovered many many fossils. It is true. Yeah, but we don't have any special technology for for discover that. Yeah, it's just only yeah we know very well about the history of sedimentations from Sangiran, about the history of every layers and all dating, and up to now is uh, very very uh, known well the studying of the layers containing the fossils. Yeah. So we know about the place where we can find the fossils. This is the first, yeah. And the second one is uh, Sangiran itself, as I present uh, yeah, a few minutes ago. It is very rich in the fossils and the artifacts. So almost states of the layers, almost every, yeah, every edge of the layers, the containing the fossils, both from human and also from animal fossils. Yeah. And the destructions of the site by the natural agency is very strong also. For example, the most, uh, the biggest part of the lithology in Sangiran represents by Kapu formations. Yeah, from the middle Pleistocene. And the Kapu formation is very rich with the fossils. And Kapu formations is very loose layers. Yeah. When there is a hard rain at night, normally some places, certain places, will be eroded and the erosions help us yeah, to unearth the discovery. So yeah, we can see that the negative actions of the natural agency, but it will uh, yeah, make the discovery to our hands. Yeah. When there is uh, when they ask me money to make excavation, it is only for certain archaeological excavations with limited yeah, deep we can excavate, but with erosions will be very, very large that we can find the fossils from the sediments of the Sangiran. So it's because Sangiran is very rich and the people live on the side. This is the only cultural heritage of UNESCO where the people about 220,000 people live on the site. And the people is the owner of the site. Yeah. So when there is erosion, the people will be the first discover of the fossils, for example. Now, normally they will give to the fossils to the museum. Yeah. And we don't have any special technique for that, special implements, just like in common archaeologists, they try to know the layers, they try to position their excavations, there, and they will discover something valuable for the new interpretations. Only like that. Thank you. Thank you. Alfred? Uh, yeah, uh, may I also ask you a question? Right? 
Uh, of course, you just mentioned the Kabu formation and, and you, you refer to it in, in your presentation uh, rightfully as, as the golden age of Sangiran. And, and that makes me wonder, I, I, I wish we would have such a Kabu formation uh, in, in the Philippines, but like in, in, in other places, uh, east of Wallace's or, or Huxley's line, there is quite a, a big gap. So we, we, have, uh, we have, of course, Kalinga, the rhinoceros site uh, dated to 700,000. But then after that, there is not much. And there's this big gap uh, un until 60,000, 67,000, where uh, we don't have anything that we can uh, properly date. And in, in Flores, for example, it's, it's also a bit like that. While uh, in, in, in Java, um, there, there, there's a lot. And there's a, a richness of, of Homo erectus and, and presence of Homo erectus. Um, so it always makes me wonder. And, and uh, may, may I ask you what, what your thoughts uh, would be on that? Yeah, that Homo erectus is only living in Java. You, you mean like that? So they, they did, at that time, they did not expand uh, towards the east, so to islands not connected <laughs> to the Sunda shelf. Yeah, yeah. And if we see about the, for example, out of Africa migrations, yeah. And I said that uh, if they migrated from Africa to Java, for example, because up to now we only found the Homarctus only in Java Island. But we have also the Sumatra, we have also the Borneo, yeah, in the west part of Indonesian archipelago. And in the eastern part, we have uh, Papua and connected with Australia for, uh, for the time yeah, during the glaciations. And I think that the, the migrations took place during the glaciations when the sea disappear because of uh, glaciations. And when they walk and arrive in Sangiran, for example, in Central Java, when they walk between Sumatra and also Borneo or Kalimantan, yeah, normally we have the same opportunity yeah, to have Homo erectus in Java, in Sumatra, or or even in uh, Borneo, for example. But up to now, we only have in Java. Hmm. Maybe in the north part, we can also Philippines. Yeah. Because all the islands was gathered by the Sunda cell at the time. But I think that the migrations up to Java was took the route between Sumatra and also Borneo. And from the bathymetry investigations, we have a very giant drainage between Sumatra and also Borneo, Kalimantan. Yeah. And maybe at the time, we have also a giant valley with many, many rivers. And this is very comfortable to be used by Homo erectus, migrated from Africa to Sangiran, for example. And they don't pass what we call Sumatra now. They don't pass what we call Kalimantan or Borneo now. But they pass at the time the valley between Sumatra and Kalimantan, Borneo. Yeah. Because Sumatra and Borneo now seems like the peak 
of the for example Bukit Barisan in Sumatra bridge and all the Homo erectus highway from Africa to Java they pass the valley between Sumatra and Borneo, Kalimantan. Now it is buried by the sea. Yeah, by the sea. Yeah, so maybe, maybe they go directly to Java. To Java. Yeah. But the presence of the tools. Stone tools, paleolithic, lower paleolithic, yeah, like chopper, chopping tool, and also flicks. They said that this is the culture produced by the Homo erectus. So the presence of the lower paleolithic tools is an indicator of the presence of Homo erectus in one place. Now, actually, in Sumatra, we have many, many paleolithic tools. And also in South Kalimantan, we have also many paleolithic tools, like in Celebes, in Sulawesi. Yeah, we have many tools. But up to now, they don't have any Homo erectus discovery there. Only their tools. Why? This is a very big question for me. Yeah. Maybe in Java, when they die, they will preserve because of volcanic material. Has a mass of the mineral that makes possible the fossilization process from the fresh bone into the fossils. But when we go to Sumatra or when we go to uh, Kalimantan in Borneo, most of them dominated by the swim area. Yeah. And the swim area will be very dangerous for the conservation of the bones. Maybe they have already presence in Sumatra or in Kalimantan, like in Java also, but their fossil is not conserved because of the sedimentation environment yeah, that makes the bones will be disappear after certain times. And only their tools remaining because stone tools will be much yeah, uh, yeah must be something like uh, not, not like uh, bones yeah and i think also that uh, sumatra or kalimantan has uh, possibility to have homo erectus but they don't conserve they don't conserve up to now yeah maybe maybe yes yeah, so <laughs> well, in java we have uh, Many volcanic volcanic uh, sedimentation with uh, many mineral uh, silica, ferrum, etc., etc. That makes possible the fossilization process from the bones to the fossils. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I noticed uh, uh, that the the flakes that that. Uh, Mylene and, and her colleagues found uh, around a 700,000 year old rhinoceros in Kalingo, Kalinga. They, they look actually uh, quite similar to what you presented uh, to us a uh, while ago as, as the Sangiran flake industry. They're also uh, relatively small in size. Um, there are a few cores, which makes it very interesting because uh, through the, the cores, uh, I uh, felt that we, we can relate the, the technology a little bit to the site of Arubo in, in, in central Luzon. The surface, uh, maybe similar age, 
But there we have mostly large tools. We have uh, hand axe, uh, chopper as, as biofacial tools, but also larger uh, chopping chopper tools and yeah. uh, that, that they are the hand axe and, and a few larger flakes. But among the cores that we found there, um, you, would, you would see similar reduction techniques that were applied in, uh, in Kalinga. So the, the stone tools can really be uh, very interesting if there is uh, no uh, hominin fossil uh, preserved. Also, I, of course, uh, Mylene, everyone, we all want to go uh, back to, to Cagayan and, and continue. And the, the place is so also so rich in sites that who knows, sooner or later, we, we might also uh, get lucky and, and find more than just stone tools and, and uh, fauna remains. But uh, may I, before I forget, uh, Harry, may I ask you a technical question? Um, because you, you showed um, the, the uh, Pukangan formation, the Lahar, that, that is exposed under the museum, 8.8 uh, .8 million years old. Uh, it, it, it looks very hard on the, on the photo and solid. And uh, I think you, you, you said it's, it's really hard. Uh, was it ever attempted to, to excavate there? And if yes, how, how do you excavate such hard deposits? Yeah, uh, I will answer the last question first, yeah. And Lahar was deposited directly from the volcano to the area about 1.8 million years ago. And now it was exposed in the center of the dome, which is the, the deepest part of the uh, yeah of the dome and this lahar is very hot and steady from the discovery there is no fossils there is no artifacts there is nothing only sedimentations of lahar yeah so i never excavate the lahar itself, never, because I know the lahar has no evidence. It is very hard. It is uh, can supporting the building. That's why the museum was constructed above the lahar. Yeah, no discovery lahar. But I concerns about the black clay. Yeah deposited directly to the lahar. This is the beginning of the black clay of Puchangan formations, dated after 1.8, yeah. As the Wanabe, Watanabe and Darwin Kardar uh, dating there, we have 1.7 million years ago. The level where I excavate is only two meters from the surface of the lahar. So still in the black clay of Puchangan. Yeah. That's why I think that this lever will represent the oldest uh, cultural layers, if we can find them. Yeah. Not in lahar, but above the lahar. So that's why I focus on the excavations in the oldest black clay of Puchangan. And at last I found the fragment, I found the thick, and so on and so on. Yeah. And the first question, yeah. the implements of Sangiran itself, very long time ago, was famous as a Sangiran flex industry. The flex Mixed from the chalcedony, its color is very uh, yellow, dark brown, and sometimes red. Yeah, and very small. The diameter is about maximum is two point five centimeters, but it was very hard material, and it was very good tip. Yeah informations of the stone tools. And we can find 
the sangiran flex industry on the surface. But recently, we don't have only flex industry, but we have only also the chopper, chopping tool, auxilian, cleaver, and so on and so on, bola. It is very big. But all the material of massive tools were, were made from andesites, silicimate andesites. It is not chalcedony anymore. Chalcedony is only material for the flex industry, but the massive tool, most of them from the silicified andesites. Why? Because during the sedimentations of the couple formations, they only have a small chalcedony material. So the homoerectus at the time, they use small fragment of chalcedony to make the sangiran flakes. Yeah. So almost sangiran flakes made from chalcedony. And the big one, they don't have raw material. If they have a boulder of chalcedony, they will use that to make a chopper, to make a shulian, to make also the, the, the chopping tool, for example, cleaver. But they don't have a big material of chalcedony, so they try to find the materials from the existed river. And I have in Kedung Dowo, in the northern part of Sangiran, a river with many, many silicified and acid resources there. So at that time, we can find the chopper, we can find the bola from the, uh, along the river made from silicified and acid. So the Homo erectus has the possibility to make flakes or even massive tools. But they use material, calcedony, small fragment from their surrounding because limited yeah, measure, big measure, only small fragment of calcedony. So they mix the flakes. And they don't have a big calcedony at the time. So they try to find another resources of stone tools massive from silicified and this is from the river and they chip to make chopper, to make chopping tool, and X and so on and so on. All the massive tools coming from the surface, coming from the excavations, coming from the river, they made from silicified and the side, yeah, not chalcedony. So the people will use a good material, but when they don't have a good material, they will use another material. Yeah, maybe it's not very good quality, but they can make uh, the massive tool with silicified and the side. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it really depends what, what is available uh, and, and that determines uh, what, what you can produce. So the, um, do we have uh, more questions in the meantime, uh, Edo? We, can, can I be heard? Can I be heard? Yes, yeah, you can. All right. Yeah. Uh, we do have uh, one question here and one in YouTube, but I'll read the one here first. It's from Daniel, and Daniel says, are there any study, studies to compare and contrast between Sangira and Orduvan Gorge tools? Orduvan culture and Sangiran. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Orduvan culture is the very, very ancient uh, technology stone tools. They use a block of stones, and they mix two or three chips in one 
one fish. Yeah. So all the one culture is a kind of a chopper with three or only two chips to make the edge of the tools. Yeah. And this uh, technology stone tools is never discovered in Sangiran. Never discovered in Sangiran. Because we have only small flakes and you know the making of the flake is very complicated. Yeah. Especially when we use Arzadoni for the tools. Yeah. And what we found, the massive tool normally is chopper, chopping tool, and also most of them is uh, Ashulian. So the Ashulian will be chip in the two faces, yeah, and maybe will leave all the cortex. Means that the tools were totally chip. And this is an advanced technology. And normally we can find in Africa, in Europe, or in China. Yeah, it is very advanced technology compared with the old one technology. Old one technology is in the yeah, Africa is Africa. And this is the most uh, primitive, not primitive, but uh, it's not uh, very advanced technology. Only two or three yeah, chips on one, 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 one massive tool. Yeah. So related to the question, I think it is not comparable to yeah, talk about all the one and also Sangiran massive tools, for example, yeah, because Sangiran massive tool is uh, formed by very complicated technology. Almost, yeah, we can see the cortex. We can see the cortex. But pebble tool or all the one tool is only two or three chips in one side. Yeah. Thank you. Um... Do we have another question? So we, we do, but uh, I think it has been answered during the presentation. So okay. we don't need to ask. So we invite everyone to really watch it in our YouTube channel, of course. Okay. Are there any more questions from the audience? I don't see any. So, uh, well, it's it's uh, 4 p.m. here, so wonderful. We just made it. Thank you so much again, Harry. Thank you for this amazing lecture, for, for being with us, for giving us the honor to open the webinar for this semester and, and share your rich knowledge about Sangiran, about the origins of, of humankind, uh, the, the many, many fossils that you have found and, and analyzed. You are welcome, Alfred. Thank you, Harry. Irene and the others. Thank you, so yeah. much. Thank you, Harry. Thank you for sharing with us so enthusiastically your, your expertise yeah. and so generously, uh, especially to the first timers, those who are hearing about Sangiran for the first time, what an enriching experience. And even for people like myself who have been to Sangiran a few times, uh, I have renewed uh, appreciation of the site. Um, and a deeper appreciation of the site. So thank you so much. It is wonderful to have you on our first talk of the semester. You are welcome for everybody. You are welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, before we, we close the, the webinar, uh, I would like to thank everyone for participating. And... Uh, we have a request that to, to, to better our future webinars, um, can we request all of you to answer the evaluation form 
um, that uh, you find the link in the chat box. This would be great. And um, let me briefly announce our lecturer for next week. It will be again on Tuesday, February 22, but this time quite early, 9 a.m. Manila time. And it will be held by Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz from the University of Pittsburgh. And he's talking about Neanderthals and Neanderthals and us, kissing kin or adversaries. So I hope to see you all next week. Uh, same Zoom room, different Zoom link, but uh, for another exciting lecture. Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you, Harry, and thank